great. So I'm talking about a particular collection, a, a collection whose name changed during the process of writing this book and, and after publication. And I'll talk about that as well. And also the, the notion of reparative description that is going as Lisa mentioned, to places and, and removing derogatory names. This comes up all the time in archives and libraries as we um, recognize that earlier terms are harmful, racist, outdated, and it's this ongoing process to heal um, from that sort of name calling. And then also it's, it's somewhat grandly titled in the second part, the future of archives and museum curation, but I strongly believe that um, coming out of this research and a long time partnership with the Nez Perce tribe, we're really starting to recenter how archival, how museum collections are curated and, and proposing a model of collaborative curation um, between um, traditional indigenous uh, native First Nation communities and repositories and thinking about ways that we can partner and support each other um, in work and description. So I'm gonna run through a bit. Okay, let me see here. Okay, good. So I'm gonna run through a, the story of the book and the main themes. And then um, a fair amount of the talk's gonna be about things that happen as the um, book was published and continues to reverberate. And the, one of the points I wanna make is that this is both a historic collection, but it's, it's also a living collection and it's, it's living in many ways. It's, it's living in the Nimi Pur Nez Perce community. It's also living because as people interact with this collection, there's new meanings, new events happen. And so I'm gonna tell quite a few stories about the collection. Um, things that have happened in, in just recent years to illustrate that point. So what we're talking about here is um, a series of 21 surviving objects. While I was writing the book, and until last June, this was referred to as the Spalding Allen Collection. Um, here are the items. It's, it's really just a fascinating gathering. It's, it's the largest, best documented, earliest, uh, Nez Perce collection anywhere in the world. Um, this was put together um, by Henry Spaulding. I'll talk a little bit about Spaulding in a minute, just in the generation right after Lewis and Clark went through. And to have so many large items in such a fine state of preservation is, is really unprecedented from the region. You know, a, a shirt will survive a basket here and there, but to have so many items and know exactly where they came from is, is really unusual and fantastic. So I'll have a few detailed slides, but this is the collection we're talking about um, tonight for the most part. So I mentioned uh, Henry Spaulding. He was the first missionary to the Nez Perce tribe. Um, he and Eliza Spaulding joined Marcus and Narcissa Whitman and uh, a couple others in the first wave of Presbyterian missions to the inland Northwest. Um, Spaulding, you can almost tell it from the picture. He's a polarizing figure. Um, you know, uh, did things like brought the potato to Idaho, introduce a printing press, but his form of Presbyterian and th that form of his colleagues was very much a um, fire and brimstone sort of religion um, based as was American policy at the time to really suppress native culture, um, to have natives give up their seasonal round, their dress, their clothes, and assimilate into white um, American culture. Even among his colleagues, Spaulding had a hard time getting along. He and um, uh, Marcus Whitman and other missionaries uh, bickered with each other. He was fired multiple times in multiple sorts of jobs. Um, but this is not a talk about Spaulding, and Spaulding in some ways is just um, a factor in, in, in telling the story because he's the one that gathered these items together. And he did this um, to help or to reward a friend of his, um, uh, Dr. Dudley Allen in Ohio, who was a supporter of the missionaries. And as a missionary um, in what is now modern Idaho, Spaulding tried as much as he could to have his mission be 
self-supporting. He ran a farm, did these other things, but he always needed funds. The Missionary Association did not provide enough for him to um, uh, supply his needs. So he interacted in this kind of private barter with friends and benefactors. So he gathered together this collection uh, to Dudley Allen, wrote a very long detailed letter about it, um, problematic in places, of course, but full of intriguing details, packed the collection into two barrels and shipped it off. And the collection survived um, in Ohio till it was rediscovered. And I'll talk a little bit about the collection um, and its history in just a moment. Um, I, I'm not expecting anybody to read this. The, it, the cursive's hard to read anyways, but um, this little bit that I, I highlighted um, yeah, has been transcribed here. And um, what's, what Spalding did is he, he gave his friend Alan an, a, an approximate evaluation of the collection so that Alan could then send um, Spalding goods that he needed for his mission. So um, he wanted things like calico cloth that he could trade. He wanted a sieve. He wanted tools. He wanted the basic material goods that he either couldn't get nearby or were very, very expensive. Um, but what this does is it um, allows us to see the extent of the collection, also to realize what survived, what's been left. And then this kind of came up as part of the arguments around the provenance or the origins of the collection. So um, he packs up the collection. Uh, this is just a detail of one of two dresses in the collection. Um, the items that are on display now at the Nez Perce National Historic Park, there's also a very detailed website that has um, Nez Perce tribal interpretations and, and cultural narratives about the pieces. I strongly encourage you, if you're at all interested, to look at them. Um, but this detailed address shows one of the things I think is so fascinating is that these, these items represent this, this moment of time and this transition too, because um, in many of the items, you see both um, items such as elk teeth that had been collected and beads and um, shells that were traded through trading networks at places like Celilo Falls, but then also the introduction of trade goods that are reused and ornaments. In this dress, in the detail, you can see thimbles that were repurposed as a decorative item on um, the court, which is a horse whip. At the end of it, there's a nib from a fountain pen. And as a recent convert and lover of fountain pens, I just find that fascinating. And there's many similar items to show how um, as the, as the Nimibu people came in contact with these trade goods, they then took them and adapted them within their own cultural parameters and created new and, and, and beautiful items um, with those uh, materials. So the collection, is packed up at modern around um, uh, Lewiston, Idaho. It goes down the Columbia, it goes to Hawaii, it gets on another ship, it goes around the tip of South America, it goes up the coast again, gets off in Boston, goes inland, the crates are smashed up, it takes a couple years, but they mostly survive. And um, Alan writes back to Spalding with a letter thanking him and then some packing advice for the next shipment, how Spalding could pack the next collection better. And, and Spalding actually started um, preparing another shipment of things, but then the mission ended suddenly um, with the Cayuse um, attack, uh, Marcus and uh, Narcissa Whitman. And, and the Whitman um, incident or massacre or murder or retribution, depending on how you talk about it and think about it, um, ended Spalding's tenure as the missionary to the Nez Perce at that period. He comes back off and on, but um, for now, Spalding's in a retreat in the story, and we're gonna continue to follow the collection. Um, it stays in Ohio with Dr. Dudley Allen. He gives it to his son, also Dr. Dudley Allen, who is a, a major benefactor to Oberlin College. And the collection comes into Oberlin via this accession list. And along through these slides, I'm gonna show you the primary sources that I work to give you a sense of, of the archive and the sources I worked with. Um, I circled it. You can, you can tell the kind of extent of description in the 1890s. The, all the items are described as one lot of Indian clothing, trinkets, et cetera. One of the item tags there, you can see buckskin dress for Indian squaw. And that language is, is very much part of this wrapped up uh, 
discussion that we're having about reparative description. And you think squaw is such an outdated and racist term as, as recently as this summer and really coming through our records, we saw it crop up in many, many of our collections at a place where we've been mindful of this for a long time. But this embedded colonialism and in times and, and examples of racism and othering um, is something that lingers in repositories everywhere. And it's part of an ongoing effort to address those um, problems and change them and update them and document those changes. Okay, so the collections uh, at Oberlin College in Ohio um, from 1893, um, it's essentially forgotten for a period. And then this historian put together most of the collection. He, he doesn't say that he found all the collection, but he reassociated the items with the letter in the library. The letter and the material items in the collection had been separated. And then importantly, he wrote a story about it in the Oberlin Alumni Magazine. And this left a trail that curators later tracked down. The late Bill Holm uh, helped rediscover it when he was at the Ohio Historical Society. And this eventually led others to discover the collection. If it had stayed on the Oberlin campus, it would have been easy, it would have been great, but the collection didn't stay there. In 1942, Oberlin put it on permanent load to the Ohio Historical um, Society in 1942, um, so it could be displayed and properly housed. Honestly, neither of those things happened. Only one item was ever displayed in Ohio, and that was a cradle board. I have a slide of that later on. And also the collection was not properly housed, but it was also um, protected by what we might call benign neglect. Um, it wasn't moved around a lot, but it also never came out. So it stayed out of sunlight and other things that could have damaged the items in the collection. Okay, um, so when the collection moved from Oberlin to the Ohio Historical Society, um, you can look at the accession register as I did and notice that several of the items in Spalding's letters are missing. Um, a couple large bags were lost. One was later just uh, refound. I'll talk about that. There's moccasins that are still missing. Um, as recently as the summer, my um, friend and colleague, Nikki Williams and Cloud, I have some photos of him, went back to Ohio to look for more of these things. And there's also a pair of women's leggings that um, probably survived the journey, but it's unclear if they'll ever be found again. As I mentioned, Bill Holm, uh, he finds out about the collection while he's doing research in London. Uh, changes his flight and instead of going back to Seattle, stops, sees the collection, and alerts uh, curators at the uh, Nez Perce National Historical Park and the Nez Perce tribe about this collection. Um, they request it, the uh, Nez Perce National Historic Park, also the Nez Perce tribe, to have the collection brought out on loan to be the cornerstone of the National Park's uh, display. Right before this all happens, Ohio Historical Society goes back to Oberlin and asks them to sign over, sign away the collection uh, to Ohio Historical Society, which they do, and the collection is loaned here. If you haven't been out to the visitor center at Spalding, it's really worth a visit. It's on the site of uh, Spalding's it, it's just on the hill where Spalding had his mission, the Clearwater River's there, beautiful exhibits. So if you're ever in the Lewiston area or you're visiting um, uh, the Nez Perce uh, Reservation, definitely stop in for a visit there and other sites. Okay, so um, while this was all going on, as early as 1979, the Nez Perce tribe started lobbying to have the Ohio Historical Society give the collection back to the tribe, trade it, um, uh, sell it, um, but Ohio Historical Society is reluctant to do any of this. And the agreement that they um, came up with between the Nez Perce National Historic Park and the Ohio Historical Society is that uh, there would be one year loan agreements. These would be renewed every year. There would be an appraisal for evaluation conducted every five years. So 
as the collection was loaned, it was appraised at $52,000, a little bit more. Um, when it came to the Northwest, the National Park Service sent it for conservation treatment to stabilize the items and prepare them um, for exhibit, paying a $12,000 conservation fee. By 1985, at the next appraisal, a Northwest appraiser named Paul Ratzka um, estimated the value at $104,850. Um, he also confirmed that Ohio had loaned um, a number of African baskets who were, that were mixed in with the Nez Perce collection. And this just kind of gives you a sense of the um, disturbed provenance of the collection. It wasn't quite kept together. They were trying to match up labels. And that, that's why there's some hope that maybe some items are still out in Ohio. Um, and by 1993, with an increase in the marketplace for collecting Native American material culture, the valuation bumped up to 583,100. And the reason why I'm talking about um, money is that money becomes a factor in the Ohio Historical Society's decision-making process. Um, other uh, requests for loans start coming in. Um, the Ohio Historical Society uh, suddenly um, asked for the collection to be returned. There's back and forth. The Park Service and Esper's Tribe negotiate for the collection is um, to stay. Ohio's Historical Society won't engage with the Nez Perce tribe, but continues to talk only um, to the Nez Perce National Historic Park. So rumors are flying that what Ohio is interested in doing is selling the collection at top dollar, putting it out on the market. Um, park curators here, um, Nez Perce tribal members really thought that if the collection left, it would never come back again. And this began a, a flurry of activity, including maybe using, at the time, the relatively new law of Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act to have the collection stay. A NAG proclaim is not pursued, just did work by the definitions of the law at the, at the period. And also, um, there wasn't time involved for that. So. Um, there's pushback. Uh, the National Park Service, the curator at the time, Bob Chenoweth, invites the community in. Um, Nez Perce experts come in to start doing technical drawings and to document the collection. Elders are brought in, they're interviewed about the collection. And uh, Nikia Williamson Cloud, who's my great collaborator and friend on the book, and we're doing all kinds of things now, he was a museum intern at the time and made a number of beautiful drawings that are um, both illustrated in the book, but also on a, a website as well. Uh, here's some details of his drawing. Nakia is a really beautiful artist, and, and this is a, a, a woman's saddle made with a cottonwood frame, uh, painted um, parflesh. Um, it's a very unusual, it's a style of saddle that um, this is one of just a handful of surviving examples anywhere in the U.S. Um, and as part of an organized effort by the Nez Perce Tribe and the National Park Service, they start collaborating together on a, a strategy for, for keeping the collection in the Northwest. The tribe organizes a, a national day of mourning, um, a program around saying farewell to the collection. They form a committee chaired by Richard Ellenwood um, to start raising money. They put out a pamphlet, um, a number of activities um, uh, go back and forth, and eventually the Nez Perce tribe is, is, is able to make an offer that the Ohio Historical Society is willing to accept, and that offer is the full appraised amount for the collection of $583,100 plus another $25,000 for the cradle board uh, for a total of $608,100 and a six-month deadline to pay in full, not a day extra, um, and if they were able to meet this, then the um, collection would stay, title would be trans transferred over. If they didn't meet these terms, the um, National Park Service had already contracted with um, movers and they had custom crates on site ready to return the collection. Um, this is the cradle board I mentioned. It's actually a matching piece with one of the dresses. They have the exact same style of beadwork together. Um, just a beautiful piece. You can't see it on the other side. There's a detail on 
uh, the Plateau People's web portal that you can see, but there's a whole row of those decorated elk teeth. And um, there's only two of those teeth per animal. So to have a, that many is just really lavish decoration and extremely beautiful. Um, and the fundraising effort starts. It, it starts a little bit slowly at first, um, but as the media picked it up, um, it really began to intensify. The Nez Perce tribe um, hired um, Tom Hudson, who was a community um, development specialist, and he launched something called the Nez Perce uh, Heritage Quest campaign. And they developed a very innovative and effective fundraising campaign to raise that 608,100 within those six months. And notes start coming in. Um, in the archives of the Nez Perce National Historic Park, there's folders of these, but you get a sense from these, the, the tenor of what was going on. They also developed one of the earliest fundraising campaigns. You know, this is uh, um, January, 1996, early uh, for the web. And um, I managed to locate this through the um, internet archive, which was just fantastic. And the website still worked. Um, it's so early, you can see at the bottom, it's it's best feed with Netscape Navigator version two and you know downloading that may be a lengthy process. This is dial-up modem days, just really kind of fun um, and interesting to see. But one of the things that um, they determined is looking for sponsors that would um, contribute the appraised amount for each of the items in the collection. And the appraisal went all over the place. So um, you could get together some friends and sponsor one of the ropes, which would be about $500. Um, the shirts, the dresses, those were significant gifts um, um, to sponsor those. So um, big donors came through. Um, Tom Redman of Redman Products, hairspray that was really popular in the 90s, maybe some of you used it. Also um, a fan of Appalo Appaloosa Horses and the Nez Perce uh, Historic Trail. Um, Lillian Disney, uh, she and Walt Disney were married in Lewiston. Her family farmed just right across the valley from the site of the Nez Perce National Historic Park. Uh, her foundation provided a $100,000 matching gift. And then lots of other donors came forward. Um, they also launched uh, what was called the 5790 campaign and $57.90, that was the evaluation that Spalding gave in his letter to Allen. And so schools started these fundraising efforts. Uh, Frontier Elementary School in Boise, Idaho, at the very start of the campaign, they were studying the Nez Perce tribe and their um, Native American history unit. And the kids got very involved. The teachers went to the PTA. The PTA sponsored um, sending out a letter to PTA associations all around the Northwest and beyond about this fundraising campaign. And it energized kids throughout the Northwest. But then you also see places like um, Little Rock, Arkansas, um, schools all around started uh, contributing as well. Um, and then this early on got my interest, uh, Pearl Jam fan, I'll just say it right there, but uh, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, they got involved, they sent in the 5790, but more important, they donated goods that were sold at auctions. And then MTV started running a series of um, public service announcements. The story got picked up on uh, national public radio. You could buy um, these posters and have them signed if you contributed 5790. There were some of the earliest um, online art auctions, concerts, just this whole flurry of activity. Um, there's folders of these letters from school kids, you know, drawing pictures, um, learning about Nez Perce history, and doing things like having bake sales, selling the privilege to chew gum in class and wear hats and do all these sorts of things um, that energized uh, their peers and really led to a snowball of a campaign um, that was ultimately successful. And just wanted to just read a, a paragraph or two um, from the book with um, Chairman Samuel Penny, his remarks at the very end of the campaign. Um, and this all happened, uh, uh, I'll, I'll read here just a little bit. On May 31st, one day before the deadline imposed by the Ohio Historical Society, the tribe achieved its goal of raising the full 608,100 
Potlatch Corporation donated $25,000, which when combined with other smaller donations, put them over the mark. Boise's Frontier Ele Elementary School, which had altered, which had alerted all of the state's fourth graders, sent a check for $2,500. Uh, Chairman Penny spoke, um, said that this purchase officially ends a 150 year odyssey for an extraordinary part of our heritage. Our people and supporters all over the US will celebrate the homecoming of the Spalding Allen Collection. Um, donations came from more than 2000 individuals, 50 schools, um, uh, people from Germany, Switzerland, France, Italy, and Japan. At the height of the campaign, Tom Hudson and his assistant Pam Palmer received 30 to 50 uh, calls a day at all hours of the night. Um, Chairman Penny said, the people of the United States have demonstrated that they value our Native American history, but that this historic event should not be seen as an acquisition of museum artifacts. It is a restoration of an important part of Nez Perce culture. We found partners and friends when we did not expect them, and we have seen a light of respect and compassion, which suggests a greater future from our United States. Uh, so powerful words. Um, you know, many times in giving different versions of this talk, that's right about the moment where I start crying. I'm glad I'm holding my act together a little bit tonight. Um, but that resonance and that emotional power of these items, which um, are so important in Esper's culture that represent the culture in this period of transition. And as my colleague and friend, Nikki williams and Cloud points out that these, these pieces today have a place in the community they're imbued with the with the sweat with the handiwork with the love with the work of families and the intention always with this sort of regalia is to pass it along from families the nez Perce is one tribe where um, individuals are not buried in the regalia but the regalia is put away for a period after a death and then bestowed on another member of the family and this can have powerful um, repercussions and to the present too, the first time, say, a, a, a noted elder whose past regalia is worn by a son or another family member, it's a way of um, honoring that individual and often brings tears to the friends and family of, of, of the former owner of those items. So by Spalding packing these things up and then going into museums and then being part of this market, this disrupted this um, traditional method of passing these articles along and memorializing ancestors. Um, so, you know, the collection is secured, it stays, um, there's a ceremony, and then, you know, it's like, whew, but the collection, the story keeps occurring and, um, in uh, 2002, um, a bag is found at Oberlin College from um, an anthropology class. Dr. Linda Grimm, one of her students, tracked it down. And Josiah Pinkham, who's interviewed in the book, and his sister Lynn Pinkham travel to um, pick up the bag, participate in a seminar. Lynn gives a weaving um, um, uh, overview and demonstration. And so, another item of the collection uh, comes home. And uh, I heard about this collection when I first started graduate school, I started working on it. I thought it was gonna be a chapter in my dissertation and like any other dissertation plan, what you think is gonna happen is not what happens and it became the entire dissertation. And then during COVID, um, I was able to spend quite a bit of time revising it and working on um, getting the manuscript ready for publication, and then starting to build a companion website that I'll show you. But another interesting thing happened to the collection and miss all these other things. In the summer of 2020, I received a text and then a call from colleagues at the Nez Perce National Historic Park, and federal authorities had um, notified the park, the FBI had contacted them, that a group associated with Amon Bundy was camping nearby and there were concerns that they might occupy the Nez Perce Hat National Historic Park. So the park mobilized with the Nez Perce tribe to move the collection to a safe place. Initially, they asked if it would be fine with WSU and, you know, it's one of these unusual things where I'm 
texting my dean, you know, like on a Sunday and we're trying to get this all. Um, we offered WCU as a home, but um, on reflection, the Nez Perce tribe decided um, to take their collection to a place where they knew it'd be secure, which was their casino. And Nakia Williamson spent a week in the casino in a suite uh, babysitting the collection. And so this is the summer of 2020, moving the collection out from the Nez Perce National Historic Park, just down the road a couple of miles. And um, it was in a secure suite with security nearby until the threat of that occupation passed. And luckily it never materialized. But um, it, I think this is one of these things where it's better to be safe than not. And uh, Nikia will probably be quick at this moment that this is the first time the saddle's been outside in a long time. So um, just seeing these collections and, and the story is just kind of part of, of this life story of the collection. The other one that I alluded to is, is as the book was getting close to being finished, um, I collaborated with Nikia on adding detailed descriptions of the collection onto the Nez Perce tribe, the Nimi Pu path on the Plateau People's web portal. And then also, embedding um, descriptions and I'll, I'll show some pictures. Um, the book came out and then as it was coming out, it was also the 25th anniversary. And for the 25th anniversary of the purchase of the collection, the Nez Perce tribe decided to finally rename the collection. There'd been talk about renaming it for quite a period. And my book ends with a discussion about, um, you know, reflecting on why is this collection named after um, Spalding and Allen, and as somebody who's worked in, in archives my whole life, I, I didn't really think or interrogate that um, because collections are always named after collectors, but in this case, the Nez Perce tribe um, rightly saw um, Spalding and Allen really as kind of products of this colonial process, and they wanted to rename the collection in Nimi Boutimpt that would be more appropriate in keeping with the heritage of the collection and the individuals who made the collection. So there was a whole series of events, um, uh, including numerous talks, events, and a renaming ceremony. And I'm going to just um, pause, the, just kind of move my slide out of the way. Oops. Oops. and just show you a little bit, if I can get this off the screen here. Okay, how do I minimize this? Sorry, I'm just a little bit PowerPoint challenged right here, but what I'm going to do is just show you a, a tiny bit of clip. Can you see that okay? Okay, so uh, this is a short video. It's linked up through the uh, WSU Press website. Um, it's The Long Journey Home. It was pre, uh, produced by Charles uh, Costanza at the Spokane Public Television Station. And he interviewed uh, Nikia and myself and created this really great um, short video. It's great with Nikia. I, I have to admit, I always cringe a bit when I see myself um, but, and hear myself. But let me just play a little bit about the renaming and the renaming process. Collections that are collected in a private sector as well as in museum collections take on kind of a colonial sort of nature in terms of their names. The culture isn't as important. Definitely the families or community are de-emphasized and the collector is emphasized. And so we understood that that was not appropriate, especially for this collection, which we wanted to bring, you know, obviously we're bringing back home. Renaming is a really important aspect in Nespers culture because it solidifies our relationship not only to our kinsfolk, our community, but also to the land and the resources as we know it itself. We wanted to bring that to a close as, as a way to, to finalize that whole part of our history. The series of events culminated in June with a formal renaming ceremony that reflected the types of ceremonies the Nimipu people had been doing for centuries. The tribe invited representatives from the Ohio Historical Society, which had been renamed the Ohio History Connection. When they found out about it, 
nobody on the board, the president, nobody had ever heard of this sale, and they were shocked. It was never meant to ever come back to our community. It was meant to always be separated from our community. And so the name Wet Huipin means something that is taken away, far away, but returns back. We felt that was an appropriate name that told the story and the important journey, the long journey that this collection went on, but we also went along with it. It's very true that they acknowledge what has happened. Not that we need to relitigate or relive that, but that acknowledgement is a part of the healing that our community needs to move forward. There was a portion of the program where we had the Presbyterian come down and they gave a formal apology. And there was a lot of very good words spoken. And so there was a lot of talk about things wouldn't have been done the way they were if they were done now. And uh, I was thinking about all these words and I couldn't help but miss the moment. And I will say to carry your message back to the powers that be at the uh, Ohio Historical Society, that we also take refunds too, so you can see that as well. Everybody got a chuckle about that and everybody laughed and that was that. Ohio History Connection realized that they needed to do something more than words. They needed to act. We thought that was the end of the story. We thought by naming it, okay, now we can move on. So the summer had kind of come to an end October and I received a call from Brian's friend, who's uh, chief of the uh, Wyanda Nation, but is also on the board of the Ohio Connection. And he let me know that they intended to return the funds back to the tribe. Okay, so um, thanks. I hope you uh, heard that okay. Um, so the the renaming um, Wakuitan, meaning something that was gone and returned um, back home. Uh, here's Pictures from the ceremony, there's Nakia with his son, uh, Nakia Cloud, who's currently working in the department with me right now on a grant, um, the renaming ceremony. It's described in a couple issues of the um, Idaho Magazine. And then as I mentioned earlier, as uh, the renaming ceremony was happening, as the book was in final editing, uh, Nakia and I worked together and Nakia filmed a number of really fantastic cultural interpretations of the collection. And we brought together uh, professionally photographed images of the item, as well as other archival sources to, to round out the interpretation. And then that powerful moment, um, for me, I had, I guess, made the mistake of getting my COVID booster like the day before, and I was so sick, uh, but I was so grateful to be able to be there and to see this, this moment of reparative healing when that full amount was returned by the Ohio History Connection. And then just the last uh, moment or two is that um, we're working on a number of other projects and um, the current grant now is, is looking at Nez Perce material collection um, held at WSU, curated in partnership with the Nez Perce tribe and doing more of these cultural interpretations involving Nez Perce undergraduate students. So we gave a talk on that, um, I guess last week, or was it two weeks ago? Um, two weeks ago, and we have another one coming up in October. And as part of this, um, our real hope is reframing how these collections are described. You can see uh, Nimi Putim, Nez Perce language used in all the descriptions. Um, we have dictionary terms built up so that you can listen to how these terms are pronounced and to kind of reframe how we do this description so that it really reflects, uh, the collections reflect the, the Nez Perce origins and also combining images with these videos of cultural interpretations. And then this is a little bit nerdy, but for my librarian colleagues out there, also making sure that um, this information is ported back into other platforms so that it stays uh, sticky, it stays with those digital objects. So wherever they go, those Nez Perce cultural interpretations, that information is also um, accessible and available. So thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. This uh, project, this work is um, something that I'm so grateful for. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, thank you all. I, I, I hope people were able to kind of stay awake. Looks like not everybody's gone, so that's a good sign. No. <laughs>
Absolutely. Well, I it doesn't look like people took my invitation to put their comments here in the chat. So we'll just open it up here in just a second. But I just have a curious question. Did the tribe, did they have something very intentional that they chose to do with the money when it was returned? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And um, um, at the tribe's request, I, I, I worked on writing a, a, an essay up that's in also Idaho Magazine. But that um, they, they took the money and divided it into two large funds. One is a fund for the cultural resources program to be able to purchase Nez Perce items, sometimes on the open market, but sometimes with members of the tribe. And this is a, an ongoing pressure in that collectors come through the Nez Perce reservation, they find out who has what, and you know, like a, one elder in particular, Leroy Seth, he's talked about this publicly, so this isn't um, confidential information in any ways, but you know, a, a vendor will come up and say, um, I'll give you $50,000 cash today for that shirt you have. And his take was, well, I could take the money and buy a new truck, but then my truck would go away and this part of the family and the culture would be lost. And so I think that endowment will help maybe purchase individual items so they don't go out onto the marketplace and they stay within the community. And then the other half of the return money is, is going into um, a Wek'tuwet'en endowment that will support graduate education for members of the tribe. There's a number of undergraduate scholarships, but um, to date there had been no graduate level fellowship. So that fund then is really going to perpetually be an aid for the Nez Perce tribe to preserve cultural heritage, to steward that collection and other collections, and to launch the next generation of, of graduate students, curators, and, and other tribal members. Thank you. That's really exciting. Uh, Dale, I think it looks like you've got your hand up. Might want to unmute yourself there first. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bond. That was an excellent uh, discussion and, and work that you've done over the last couple of years with the pandemic going on. I, I, uh, I just want to point out, uh, I was a, a student of Bill Holmes and I just went to a celebration of life they had for him at the Burke. And that just adds another feather in his cap. He did amazing work. And that's interesting that he went way out of his way to go to Ohio to see this collection. Uh, we think of him as mostly on the coast, but he, he certainly was throughout the plains and, uh, and plateau. Uh, I guess my question is just out of your research, and this doesn't normally happen, so, but I was wondering if any, any if Spalding himself recorded one, something about interacting it to get things from individuals, including their names. And uh, did, how did he get them? Did he, uh, did he have to purchase them? Is that part of the value that he, he puts on it? I mean, a lot of times they're sponsored with funds to go out and buy things from mm -hmm. different entities, but I don't know if Spalding was. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Dale, and it's a crux of one of the chapters because it's, it's unclear. Um, he doesn't name individuals. And also the Presbyterian that, Presbyterianism that he was espousing at the time was very much to put this regalia away, cut hair short, to abandon these things. So it's, it's thought in oral history that, um, you know, he told tribal members it was bad and then he reused it and and one of the um bill picard who's a member of the nez Perce tribal executive committee i interviewed him and he he kind of did this uh, he likened it to the story of of a, a brother telling his younger brother that halloween candy is really bad and he shouldn't keep it and then <laughs> takes his younger brother's candy and eats it all it's like you know that kind of dynamic but um you know that cradle board and the dress they're matching and the cradle board is is uh, like a very small one, a three quarter size. And there's some speculation that they may have been commissioned pieces by Spalding, like a follower may have, um, maybe Spalding traded something or did it to um, 
you know, make Spalding happy and then Spalding parlayed If you would have told us a little bit more, I think um, lineal claims by families would have not, would have been possible without going through this um, fundraising route. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, so there are clearly adherence to Spalding and maybe these are given away very willingly. Um, but the context is a little bit unclear. But if we, if we look at Spalding's reputation, both in the literary sources and through oral history, um, you know, uh, Nimi Pu historians have likened him to being more of a traitor than a missionary later on in his, in his thing, the way Whitman was. So um, that's a kind of rambling roundabout. We just don't really know. He, he, does, he doesn't tell us. And, and I think any of us who work in archives are always haunted by these archival silences. You know, it's like our sources can get a certain, a certain way, but they often leave these important gaps. And I think that's where um, oral tradition and thinking about Spalding in the context of similar missionaries operating provides some of those clues. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Sarah, do you have a question? I do, yes. Um, and I'm sorry if I missed it early on, but so I think I heard you say that the book sort of started a, as your dissertation, um, but what brought you to, to the story to begin with? What was the first little um, kernel that, that um, you know, started the unfolding, I guess? Thank you so much, Sarah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I was one of these people who can't ever seem to get away from school. You know, I, I went right from undergrad to graduate school, did my two masters, uh, didn't finish my PhD. I'd started in history and Roman history and it was kind of in the back of my mind. And after I rose up through the ranks at WSU um, in the libraries, we have one of the few surviving like real perks um, I think the other real perk at WSU is on Fridays, the faculty and staff get a free coffee, which is great. I love that. But the perk that I was able to take advantage of is taking classes essentially for free, um, except for a, uh, like you need to pay a full semester of tuition at the end and around exams. But that allowed me to go back to graduate school. And I had thought about writing a dissertation looking at collectors and collections that that founded repositories in the region. And I wanted to save this one for last. And when I started working on the chapter, um, it just continued to grow. I'd, I'd heard about the Spalding Allen collection in um, I think my second graduate seminar in history. I'd heard about the Pearl Jam connection. I'd heard about all this money um, raised and um, all this happened two years before I started at WSU. And, um, it had kind of receded and people weren't talking about it and digging into it. It just became clear looking at the archives and then doing these interviews um, that this would make a dissertation. And then it's just one of these things, I, I think as a graduate student, your mentors always tell you, choose a topic you love because you're going to be living with it for a long time. And I honestly have to say that this um, dissertation project and the reviewing and my family and a lot of baking kind of got me through the pandemic. It, this Working on this really gave me a purpose and um, I'm really grateful that I um, was able to have that time at home to work on it because it, I think it, it helped me revise and finish the manuscript a full year early. And then it just so happened all this 25th anniversary, all these events and the renaming were taking place at the same time. So um, just very, very fortunate. But yeah, hearing that story about the fundraising um, being aware of the collection, the Pearl Jam connection, starting to look into the archives, I just got hooked. And what a clear case of um, institutional kind of hubris. And at the time, this was not unusual, but also at the time, thousands of donors contributed and, and called out Ohio for what they were doing, which was, you know, selling this collection off at a ransom price, a collection they had never invested in, had essentially no connection to. Um, so I think too, it was an important uh, broader issue and we see it framed in all kinds of ways today with um, Benin bronzes across the globe starting to be returned. Um, you know, Smithsonian talking about repatriating more collections, but you know, there are there are these items, there are these collections, 
these legacies of colonialism in museum where, um, you know, government officials, missionaries, others went in, cleared out material cultures of many um, individuals and then shipped them across the world and they've never come back home. And like Nikia said in that thing, nobody ever thought this collection would come home, but it's, it's because of the doggedness of scholars and figures like Bill Holm and the advocacy of the tribe. And then thousands of people contributing that, that this most important, this most unique collection came back. Um, and then one other thing I'll, I'll say about appraisals and the other thing too is like, it seemed like a ransom at the time. Um, and it was, it was challenging. I mean, 1996, um, $608,000, that was real money. I mean, that was more than a million dollars to raise. Um, but also a recent appraisal of just one of the shirts values it at $2.5 million today. And that's another part is that this marketplace and the high dollar amount put on these collections also burdens traditional communities with things like paying for insurance. Uh, so that doesn't go away. That was a long answer, Sarah. Thank you so much. And thank you for your work at the State Library. Thank you. Hopefully the story will uh, inspire more, more museums and, and places to give things back and, or pay back. I, I think that's the, the next chapter of, of looking at these things. And I just have to say, working with Nikia, there, there's a, a small subset of items that were clearly, clearly looted and stolen from caches during uh, eight, the 1877. It's often referred to as the Nez Perce War. Really, it was the Nez Perce retreat from invading armies trying to um, move bands um, onto a reservation. So um, I think there's more of these items to go back home, but you know, there's there's um, materials that were looted and taken away. Um, the Elgin bronze at the British Museum. I mean, most of the British Museum. Well, I should say most of the British Museum collections, but many of their items really need to go back to the countries where they belong. It's it's high time. I'll get off my soapbox. So. <laughs> well, thank you. We have just a couple minutes left. If anybody would like to ask a question that hasn't already? I will, um, oh, Dale, go ahead. You just need to unmute yourself. It's better muted. <laughs> but, oh, okay. Thank you. I already did ask a question. I appreciate that. I, uh, I'm an archaeologist and I, I'm an adjunct with WSU. I'm also director of the Pacific Northwest Archaeological Society, which is sort of like what you're running. And I just wanted to point out, we have the Spanish galleon uh, that was just located on the Oregon coast from the 1690s as our next speaker. They found parts of the wooden structures from the, the boat or the ship, <laughs> big ship from 1690s. Um, I did my dissertation on, on, on the OZEP basketry in Hopo and, and, and Dr. Bond knows that very well. I, I just know that there's a big uh, basketry collection uh, at the Museum of Anthropology at WSU. And I'm just, uh, is that part of what you brought together? Uh, Dr. Bond in those uh, websites, because uh, it's there's quite not, an impressive collection. <clears throat> not those baskets, but there's items from um, the Lucullus McCorder collection, and he um, collaborated with Yellow Wolf, a warrior in the 1877 Nez Perce War, and published the first um, native perspective on the events. And um, so those items we um, curate in partnership with the Nez Perce tribe, and that's part of this, this next grant. I should also say too that um, this item of where collections go is, is really a nuanced one. And um, I think there's many different models. Um, not all native communities have museums or are in a position to accept these, or um, do they have the capacity to do it? But I think that dialogue that working together and then when appropriate, when those items are desired for ceremonies and other things, 
Um, I think that's, a, you know, um, important conversations for uh, libraries, museums, and other cultural heritage organizations to have with, with the communities that created these items. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, we're just about at the top of the hour. So I um, just, I wanna thank you so much, Trevor. Um, I think here in the comments, uh, Ann Watanabe said, what an uplifting story. And I think that's exactly where I'm feeling right now at this moment as well. Um, and what a plot twist to have the money be returned. Um, really kind of a hopeful, um, hopeful, forecast hopefully for the future. Um, but anyway, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for attending tonight. Um, the, the comments and the accolades and the comments here, um, I know everybody enjoyed this so much. So I thank you so much. Please check our website uh, for our program next month. I'm just putting in the, the URL right here. And I also did put in the URL for the People's Plateau website as well. So if you wanna go back and look more into that as well and see some of the descriptions and things that Trevor was talking about. Uh, but until next month, thank you all for being here tonight and uh, have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye everyone. Bye Trevor. Thanks. Thanks.